the Kenya dairy sector has changed radically over the last 15 years. And it was actually one of DFID's very first, what is now known as a market systems development project. Back then, it was a business services market development project. Um, and around the table, we have the people who actually did that, who put it together. We have um, Colin Zapoyo, who was the DFID project officer in charge of supervising it. We have Kevin Billings, who was the team leader for the program that ran it. And then we have Harun Baya, who was the main facilitator, who really did a lot of the work. And Harun, being a Kenyan, working in Kenya, is with his same organization that has been continued working in the sector since 2001. So he has really had the in-depth tracking and is probably known by more Kenyan dairy people than any other person and is accredited with really helping to transform the sector. And so this is going to be the story of the, how the sector has transformed. And it's really, you know, a lot of our work tends to be focused on services, helping a company do more sales or helping a linkage. But this is really a tale of regulatory change. By working with the regulator and getting the regulations changed, that actually led to the major driver of this transformation of the sector. And it's, it's a very impressive story. And my role in all of this was that I did the initial analysis on the project I had the, and the design. I then had the pleasure of coming in seven years later and doing the evaluation and then have been working with the sector every year, in particular with Harun, and tracking the results over the years. So we, we actually have 15 years of data, which is really pretty amazing to see how something's been working, especially since there have been so many other projects that have jumped in and jumped out without looking at the history, understanding where it came from. <coughs> the project, well, the first project ended in 2008. Harun got a second small project, which he ran till 2010. DFID, in the meantime, has spent 10 times more money on other activities in the sector with much less impact because they didn't look at the same parts of it. Um, and so there are currently very large projects spending millions of pounds assisting the dairy sector. Uh, but what we'll see is that it actually didn't take that much money. Um, so as I was saying, this is a story of transformation. The industry has changed quite a bit. We've had a, a formalization of the informal sector. And so we'll see how that actually happened. But most importantly, what we're interested in is if it's about poverty, gr the sector has been growing steadily both in numbers of participants, particularly at the smallholder poor level, the volumes of product flowing through, the quality of the milk from a food safety standpoint has increased and income has increased. This growth has been driven by the informal sector. And we'll see that story and we'll hear the people who did it. But the transformation has been led by government policy. But it was facilitated by these two projects. And the roles that these two projects played are really kind of taking a non-traditional approach, really had a major impact. One was the DFID Business Services Market Development Program, which was one of DFID's first projects. And Collins will talk a little bit about that as we get into it. And then Harun was running a DFID uh, Governance Challenge Grant. So it's interesting, it was actually a governance challenge grant that led to the major, many of the major changes. So we'll be looking through the initial analysis, implementation approaches, and changes. But just to set the scene, Jim was also talking about industrial strategy and understanding how a sector grows. So when we did the initial analysis, we laid out the structure of the industry, the markets, who was there. We identified how many people there were in the sector and who they were working with. What were the relationships? And we really found that there were four different channels. But at the bottom of it, you had s over 600,000 smallholder producers. But they were selling through a wide range of different uh, players. And we have large dairies involved. We have lots of informal traders selling raw milk to the market. 
we had a number of small dairies selling cheese and yogurt but not selling milk. But these four channels were really driving, you know, were the, the basic relationships between the market actors. But what we were most interested in were the bottom group, 625,000 smallholder farmers. Very important, you look at the prices that were being sold at the, at the market level, 27 to 30 shillings if you were buying raw milk. So this is m warm milk being sold directly to households. Or if you bought pasteurized milk, it was 50 to 52 shillings a liter. What do you think that meant for the poor consumers? Which milk do you think they preferred to purchase? Well, they actually much preferred to purchase the raw milk. So the total amount of milk being commercialized in Kenya in 2001, only about 200 million liters was going through the formal dairies. 700 million liters was being delivered direct to households and to milk bars through the informal traders. And 35% was being sold directly just kind of at the rural level between producers and their neighbors. So out of 1.4 billion liters of milk being sold, 1.2 billion was in the raw milk sector. But guess what? Raw milk is illegal. It's illegal to sell raw milk. In 2001, it was illegal to sell raw milk, raw milk in Kenya. But it was happening. And so the question was, how do you really take this you know, group that are handling more than 50% of all the milk, but who are being penalized by the regulatory environment, and who do we think is supporting and, and pushing the regulatory environment? Well, those large dairies on the right. They're out there saying, make it illegal. Stop them. Arrest them. And the question really was, well, if 85% of the milk is going through the informal sector, why are we putting all of our emphasis on the large dairies that have so much power in the relationship? They sit, the first time I met the head of the Kenya Dairy Board, Mr. Kenyatta, who's the owner of the largest dairy in the country, happened to be there. It was a very pleasant meeting. We had a great meeting. But you know who has lunch with the, the head of the regulatory body and who doesn't. And there was a very conflictual relationship between the two sides. So just some of the main constraints. We said, well, how are we going to, what could a project do? What should a project do to help figure out how to really affect that area where 85% of the milk that was being marketed was going. Because if they had made it absolutely illegal for the raw milk to be sold, prices were much higher, right? A lot of the demand would have fallen off and a lot of those smallholder farmers would have been put out of business. So some of the main issues that the project was looking at to confront food safety was a very important one. We've already talked about the fact that the informal trade of raw milk was illegal and that what that but it was happening so what did that mean transaction costs were high they were constantly being stopped by the health department the police department they were being fined their vehicles were being seized their milk cans were being taken away or they'd just be held for a couple of days the milk would spoil very high transactions costs it was actually leading to a great increase the regulator was definitely influenced by the large dairies, but they also had a couple of other issues. They didn't have much money from the government. Since 80% of the milk was being sold through informal channels, and their revenue was coming from collecting taxes on milk that was sold, they were missing out on revenue from 80% of all milk. And they didn't know how to regulate. You know, this, it turned out there were 30,000 traders. How, as a regulator, do you regulate 30,000 people, that you don't know who they are, where they are. These were some of the issues. And then there were issues on image for the raw milk traders. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to Kevin, who was confronted with this situation, and trying to figure out, well, what do we do? And how do we do it? And remember, this was 2003. So 2002, end of 2002. You know, these projects, this was one of the first projects. So Kevin, over to you. We had this very, very good analytical background to what it was, the, gr the graphs you've seen before. 
this idea that you can actually look at the milk sector and say, well, this is the warm milk. We used to call it the, the warm milk and then the cold milk chains, and they were, were quite distinct. The 1958 Dairy Act is what controlled the dairy industry. The 1958 Dairy Act said the following, any substance taken from a bovine or, you know, or, or goat that was not chilled to four degrees centigrade within four hours of being put in a can was no longer milk, uh, which is, you know, only, only a colonialist back in 1958 would have been dumb enough to push that on someone. Now, the reason that drove this, and it's Bill hasn't mentioned, and it's important, any Kenyan you know, the Kenyans are the largest consumers of milk almost in Africa because they drink masala tea. They boil milk and they add their tea leaves and their spices to the milk and they drink it that way. And when I actually asked the head of the, the biggest dairy there, did, did he only use uh, pasteurized milk? He said, no, no. He said, no, no, no. Half the time, either my mother, you know, who is the former first lady of Kenya, or my wife's mother is here. And if you don't serve them, cr when you boil the milk, if it doesn't form on the top of this <coughs> layer of cream that you can go, then it's not the sort of milk you should be using to make tea. So even he, as head of Brookside Dairies, kept a couple of cows outside so his in-laws could have raw milk. So that's really where we, we started. Okay. So we had all this kind of... And I, and I like, by the way, again, this, you know, this is a, a subsector analysis where you actually then define the kind of processes from input feed, production, collection, bulking, cooling, pasteurizing, processing, transporting, wholesaling, retailing, and finally at the markets. And I think these sort of systems, subsector analysis, really give you an, a real advantage. You know, th we could talk about it. Now, a lot of the stuff, the kind of the current thinking in M4P is that you should try and analyze the breakpoints here you know, of all the market actors going up it. And uh, you, you would find, of course, if you'd done that, that there were two separate milk markets. The one milk market, the cold milk market, and then this warm milk market. So we started looking at, we're, we're the business service market development program. We're only looking at the development of service markets. So we could see right at the beginning that there was a probable service market in terms of training traders, transporters, milk bars, in both food safety and the safe handling of milk. So right at the beginning, we realized there was an advantage here. But in fact, we didn't actually hit straight away on that market. What we did do, we were very, very impressed where and where we started was on this side here. So in this kind of collection and bulking process, we, and again, this is again one of the things you learn about in market development systems. It's quite clear that what happened, we the, the, a few of the more advanced cooperatives had already developed a milk chilling plant. So you took, you got up in the morning, you milked your cow, you shoved a couple of uh, cans in an in a, in a, uh, ox cart or a, a little donkey cart, went down to the service hub, delivered your milk, and two or three of the co-ops had become clever. You delivered your milk, and all they did, simple innovation, they added a scale on the loading platform. So you poured your milk into a scale. It immediately said so many kgs of milk. They took a sample to look for blue bodies in terms of you know, uh, buildup of, uh, of uh, pathogens in the milk. And then the person, straight away, they elect a head electronic system. He was given a credit note. You've just delivered 32 kgs of milk. That went straight onto his account. He could walk around the other side of the co-op, go in there and say, I'm down here with my cart. I need two bags, 50 kg bags of dairy meal. And they would issue a buying order. He would then walk across the road to the agri-vet store, buy his two bags of uh, dairy meal, put them in his thing and go home. And this service hub became what we really started selling. Also, the nicest thing is a guy could come into the, the milk in the morning and say to the, the collection point, oh, by the way, I think my cow is coming on heat can you send the AI person? And there was a very, very good AI service running already. So we, we then started thinking, well, we could look at a bit at the service market in terms of AI, mainly because the dairy industry in Kenya is driven on zero grazing. People do not keep a bull. They keep the animal in a shed. They cut grazing, they cut grass, napier grass, and feed them. So because it's very small uh, thingies. In fact, there's a, a, a side benefit. 
because of the use of, of napier grass, there's hardly any erosion on the side of roads in Kenya in the, in the hilly areas because every bit of a hill has got people have planted napier grass on it. So, Kevin, you, did, you, you were involved in a lot of Yes. Service. So, we, we were pushing uh, laboratory testing and then looking at the, the kind of service markets for information trans through media programs and working with the Livestock Breeders Show, which was an annual show where they brought in all the bulls that were generating the semen for this. Okay. We'd looked briefly at service markets in terms of dispensing, looking at automated uh, milk dispensing, which didn't work, and the hawker distribution model. So basically, we then started thinking, well, this bit here, the most important bit being the enabling environment. And what we started to do is now look at the, for KDB, the formalization of the industry stemming from training on quality. And this whole idea evolved simply because of how what it normally happens in, in market development programs. The current chief executive of the Kenya Dairy Board is a very nice guy, politically ambitious. People who know him will know exactly how politically ambitious he was. And he drank red wine. And every time he went out with the kind of the, the main book guys in the Dairy Board for a meeting, he'd, he always looked a bit embarrassed to say, uh, can I have a bottle of red wine as well? Because it makes you look like a bit like an alcoholic, a whole bottle, everyone else getting a beer. Now, I also drink red wine, so we became very good friends over South African reds. <laughs> so, and we, and we uh, sat down one night, you know, when the big guys had gone to bed, drinking red wine till late in the evening. We decided, well, if only there was a way which you could certify the trainers. He said, well, why don't we train people? He said, well, how do we know they're going to train the right things? He said, how about if you certify the trainers? Yeah, we could live with that. So what happened is this idea increased, uh, an increased consultation and branding cake uh, of uh, Kenya Dairy Board quality, improved income for the Kenya Dairy Board, and better monitoring and evaluation. And this thing me here, the key driver here, was the following. The 1958 Dairy Board Act said that if m milk was being carried and was licensed by the Dairy Board, the police were not allowed to stop the vehicle. So we actually used that simply thing of saying, well, let's look at how we can do it. So we ended up in getting them to, we actually helped with, the, we worked with them to design the training program and approve the, and they approved the training courses. Okay, they, we increased consultation. There's, we helped set up a national dairy regulators consultative forum, regional regulation uh, forums, and stakeholder groups, formation of district stakeholders committees branding this Kenya Dairy Board quality. So you had a little milk bar in a high density area, you know, whether in Kusumo or in, or in Nairobi, and literally a sticker on it saying approved by the Dairy Board. And they went along and actually inspected now, there was a special training program for people who ran a milk bar, because they actually then had to boil the milk one extra time before they sold it. And increased confidence and improved income. What started happening is people started paying the cess on all the milk. All these traders were. And I think the most important thing, we're talking to the chief technical officer at KDB. He said, Mr. Billing, things have changed. When we started, the traders, when we uh, arrived in an area, they used to run away and hide. Now they come up to me and ask me, when are we getting our license? Because we finished the training course. And so the training course was done. You could then, we had specialized trainers who train courses for traders, milk bar operators, transporters. And uh, they all got big increase in income. And basically, we worked with the KDB to actually do that, actually try and improve their systems of how to track and, and do it. Because they, previously, they had no idea. They were dealing with maybe 2,000 large, rich owned dairies. And, uh, suddenly this, their numbers started rapidly increasing. It's now a major source of income for the Kenya Dairy Board. So Kevin, how, how many years did this take? Uh, this started in about two, th well, drinking red wine a long time before. <laughs> 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 but uh, from maybe 2002, because we had one of our first, the, one of the ways we did this program, we actually started, we had a, a simple seminar. We invited everyone who was considered a person of interest in the build thing, me, we presented your uh, subsector analysis and said to people, like, where should we start? 
and we literally identified our intervention points um, in a one-day workshop on the dairy industry and a one-day workshop on uh, export horticulture. And that's how we, we started the intervention program. Agreed at the time we were you know, doing lots of things because I think that's how you do it. So we started 2002, and by the time we ended 2006, towards the end, um, Harren Bai was one of our grantees. It's amazing what you can do with a grant if you uh, adjust the scoring system before you go out. To, you can make sure certain people can win. That's the secret, I shouldn't tell you. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so four years. Four, four years. And, yeah. And the m and &E system, I mean, they didn't know when you first started that you, had to, you would have to fix their m and &E system. No, they didn't. They, but we, right from the beginning, we, we actually uh, sat with them and said, look, what you need to do is set up a, a, a computer-based database. So everyone, all the trainers, their training centers, the trainers had a number. And we persuaded them that if they did that, it would be able to monitor how good the trader was, how the trade good the trainer was. So right from the beginning, we just introduced them to a simple database system. They have now quite a complicated one. <laughs> okay. Yep, thank you. Oh. Mm. You were the deputy project officer, and that, you know, for those of you who may know Kevin, he's, he's enthusiastic. He's the entrepreneur of the business, but he's also all over the place. Yeah. Um, so but I tell you what, I, I, always, tell, I always love introducing Collins because he's my best example of how to educate someone. <laughs> because at the beginning, he was a total pain because he kept blocking everything. We actually had to get him to be more liberal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll not use this. Uh, no, they, they want you to use it because they're recording. Oh All right. Okay. I think let me just put all this in context because it must have had a beginning point. In the 80s, Kenya went through something that was really important for the dairy sector. We had a president called Moi, and Moi introduced something in primary schools known as school milk. That put the foundation for the widespread use of milk by households as they grow. So while we were sitting at DFID office, we started thinking, how do you therefore make this increasing need for milk to be available? And to be available in channels that were allowed by, 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 by the government. Bill talked about policy was actually stopping the sale of raw milk. Again, we sat in the office and said, how do we get that system to support raw milk subsector within that sector to grow? So we were faced with a situation where there was policy issue while the market demand for milk was actually increasing. But I, as the project officer, I was asked to design a business services market development what? program. So I had a policy issue to be addressed using a business service development market. And believe me, if there was anything that created the first tension between my office and Kevin was you want to work on policy and yet this is business services development program, how do we bring those two together. So we designed this. Our design was not a blueprint. He will tell you that we asked him to do the uh, subsector analysis. It came back with, uh, I think there were about three subsectors. There was horticulture, then there was the dairy subsector. Meat. And meat, yeah, livestock. And uh, we said, okay, let's focus on the dairy because of the opportunities that existed. In deciding which sector to focus on, we did not know what would happen. I had no clue. The subsector analysis told us there was opportunity, but I had no clue which way it would go. So I developed a framework broadly that allowed whoever came in to do anything. Lesson from that is that when you do a blueprint, you end up with a defined path. But when you leave it broad, 
then it could take any direction as long as you have the overall goal, the long-term goal of creating a vibrant market for everybody to participate in, then it could take any direction. So that was really useful in hindsight that we let it to be loose. Managing Kevin, ha, that was the fun part. <laughs> As a donor sitting in a donor office, you have this blinkered approach of using the log frame, uh, using what do you call it? This uh, result chain. <laughs> Believe me, nothing works like that at all. I only learned that later on. But this is the guy who actually taught me that it doesn't work like that. He came in and started working. You saw the other, the first bit. In all corners of the world, this head of mine was too small to capture all that messiness. But it was quite messy because he was touching different parts of the value chain. And believe me, as a donor who is required to give results and show that it is progressing, that was really, really difficult. We fought many battles, some very bad ones. But when it started yielding results, it was really exciting. Another battle we had to contend with is that he was working with the private sector and regulators. Somewhere, DFID was telling us, you can't put money into government systems. Also, private sector, we didn't know how to work with them very well. So he came up with instruments that I'd never used before. I was used to giving NGO grants. But he came up with strange things that were not in our scheme of things. How was I to deal with it? Another area of war. We had to fight. But finally, when the sense of what instruments he was using came into place, then we followed suit. So the donor actually followed the footprint that was being developed. Our last problem, private sector wants decisions now. Donors want to go through, yeah, it's an MOU sign. Is it? Uh -huh. And that was a problem. He wanted decisions yesterday. I was still consulting with the powers to be elsewhere. Again, another tension. Later on, it became apparent that for such type of work to, uh, to go forward and move fast, it requires some level of flexibility that is not normal. And that is true of all market development programs. You must be flexible, you must be nimble, and sometimes just outrightly entrepreneurial or disruptive. He was one of those people who really disrupted the way we thought about uh, program management. Colin, some, some of the activities that he put up there didn't work. Yes. And what, what was the reaction inside different when I think when, when, when they didn't work, we found a reason to really hit back at him. <laughs> but because some of the things he did were working and creating mileage and were building towards the longer term goal we were looking forward to, we allowed him go with, uh, get away with murder at times. Yeah, I always remember the, the best thing, he, I used to phone him up and say on Thursday, say, look, we really need decision on this. He said, look, it'll take me some time. And he'd bring me the following Wednesday, say, by the way, I've chatted with Catherine, who was both our bosses. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and he'd say, well, it's been approved. I went, thank God I said, you know why? Because we had the meeting on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> so that was quite interesting. So the thing is that in certain instances, when you are doing such a thing, many things will fail. But if you keep the main strand that shows elements of sustainability and working, then follow that strand. And it will never be in the form of a log frame. It will never be in the form of a what? Of a, of, a, of a result chain. It will be something completely different. Could I just say one thing? Very critical. Note that this was a, a business services market development program. It was not an enabling environment program at the beginning. So how do you move out from business services and shift into enabling environment. It was by the realization that actually, if you want to cause systemic change, it will be caused at the point where 
you are dealing with an issue that affects a broad range of actors within the same space. Critical. So, we realize that without fixing the dairy board issue, all this other work of training on the side of trying to get the dairy hub working was not going to draw in the largest proportion or largest portion of the market into the mainstream. That is when we said, go for it and fix it. Thank you. Thank you, Collins. And Harun is the man who actually did it. So, <laughs> for the benefit of those who did, don't know Kenya, they, sorry, Bill, I'll stand behind you here. Um, the informal or raw milk sector was not always the dominant. It emerged as a dominant in the post-structural uh, change uh, era, where the main uh, cooperative, that national cooperative that was mopping all the milk, uh, started falling apart uh, because of interference with the government. And suddenly, thousands of smallholder farmers were left without a market for their milk. And independent traders stepped in. So rather than the industry collapsing, the small individuals who could sell only a few liters of milk started finding their way to the market because they had no cooperative to, to deliver the milk to, and the cooperative was then all going to sell to these big cooperative creameries called Kenya, uh, you know, cooperative creameries. Actually, they still make the best butter in the world, in, to my view. But that, yeah, let me go back to this. Let's build, you want to see? Yeah, so site was one of the local facilitators who responded to the invitation for concept papers and responding to addressing the challenge um, you know, that had been described in the subsector analysis. And SAID came in as actually a facilitator. BSMDP, which is the project that was being run, SAID came in, and the first step we did, uh, because it was clear that the regulatory framework uh, was the main hindrance, we talked to KDB. And the Kenya Dairy Board had the mandate of regulating the industry, and they were the enforcers of that law that Bill talked about. And we thought, well, you cannot change the law. Uh, it will take forever. So how do we meet, what is the critical problem they have with raw milk? And that's when we came to the point of safety, human safety. Is the milk hygienic and safe enough for consumers? And then that's where we said, well, suppose you train people on handling it. Because 85% of the milk will remain that way. Suppose you ensure that those who handle milk have meet minimum uh, standards and skills and have certification uh, you know, to train. And they say, yes, we can agree to that, and then they can be. So, but how do you train thousands of people? What will give them the incentive? Uh, then, uh, you know, because remember these are smallholder tra you know, traders. They earn very little money. Uh, why should they go for training? And that's why you know, we say, well, in, if you go to a formal institution, it's ne never going to work. It's going to be too expensive. You know, outreach will be a problem. Suppose we develop trainers as individual service providers. And then they go out, they develop their own market, they train this, uh, you know, I don't need to go back to that because Kevin has co co covered it. Uh, but so we developed the trainers and accredited them jointly with the project and KDB was doing the accreditation. So, and then they, these trainers will provide training for milk transporters. Now these milk transporters would, would take milk and they still do take milk to the market directly or to some of the big processors. But at their point of contact with the milk, they are traders and they need a license. So they were, we developed one of the modules for training was for milk transporters. The other one for, was for informal milk vendors. These, we call them hawkers. Um, and th they would get the training from these individuals and by once they certify Kenya Data Board, then they would get a certificate and a license to operate. And then the farmer groups who are collecting milk were also needed to train them. At that group, which we, fourth group we trained, are what we call the regulators. We developed a guide for regulators. Because at, at the district, administratively at that point, Kenya was being administered through districts. And at district level, you had public health workers, you had the police, you know, and all of them had an influence on how the laws were were being uh, you know, carried out. So we brought them together so that if a KDB li officer gave the license, the public health officer doesn't stop them, neither do the police. 
So they all needed to get together. And we had to spend a lot of time informing and educating them why a, tra a licensed trader should be allowed to take and how they are meeting the minimum uh, health requirements. So this is, this is and all these uh, institutions or actors in the chain that we, we also brought in a few of the NGOs that, you know, in the system so they can understand, uh, you know, the raw milk. The raw milk was always difficult for many and it still remains a difficult area for many donors and NGOs. Yet it's 85% and remains about 80% of the entire market. Then, um, so, so this was the end of 2008. Yes. End of the uh, BSMDP. Yeah. Well, maybe you can go back a little bit here. So by by the t by the time we were closing, uh, you know, BSMDP, we had these trainers already working. They were training. The, there was nearly 10,000 of these traders who were already licensed or in the process of getting licensed, and the aim of the project were met in that sense. And each this system was running on its own. At the district level, there were these forums where these three groups of regulators met frequently. Actually, one missing here is the Ministry of Livestock because they were always part of these regulatory forums. And this is how we closed BSMDP. There were trainers providing training, traders being licensed by KDB, KDB making their own money, and a, and a system for monitoring them. However, however, somewhere bef a year before um, the project closed, we realized that there were still issues which were outstanding. The traders were not always as protected for several reasons. There were many of them among them who didn't enroll for training and pay for it. So, you know, whereas Bill would be licensed and selling milk, I am selling milk, but I'm not licensed. So I'm not bound to, to, to follow what he's doing. And therefore, in, there was always a problem. And they were not always protected. The powers were quite strong. Then. Generally in the society, the continued, the negative perception of, uh, of raw milk sector pers you know, still persisted. And more so the imbalance of power, you know, for reasons we have already talked about. And uh, yeah, again, large number of these traders continuing their work. So we wondered, what are we going to do about this? So the leaders of this, some of these people called us and said, how can we try to create some form of harmony in the sector? And we discussed with them, and we agreed that we form a daily traders association. And this traders association will be for all the licensed and trained traders. And we began a process. That's why we went to the DFID challenge fund under the governance uh, window of funding. And we say, this is a, a, a governance issue, a value chain governance issue. Can we have money for it? And they gave us a grant uh, to, to deal with the organization of traders uh, in order to support uh, the, the, the sector. So, and it's a long process. I will just quickly skip through it, uh, skim through it. And we, we got into a process of mobilizing all the traders in all the areas who had actually been trained and were licensed. And we began a consultative process for them about self-organization. And, you know, and we, we developed four pillars, a, a, a program, uh, a capacity building program, which with four pillars, I can just mention them. One of them was service delivery to, the mem to their own members, governance among the, the, the traders, the services they would need to deliver and offer to their members, and a fourth one, advocacy and lobbying capacity in order to deal with, uh, with the power issues in the value chain. And then, we, you know, and, and then ongoing support. We continue to provide you know, very light touch support in order to, 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 to support the, the enterprises that are growing. Um, so the, the, the groups, uh, the traders, they, they organize around uh, milk bar owners, by that time, this category of traders called milk bars was blossoming all over Kenya. And even today, you go to many towns, they are, they are milk bars. Essentially, they, 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 they pasteurize milk, serve it on the table. That's where most people have lunch. They sell yogurts and other value-add products. They are traders who run bicycles. Now it's gone on to motorbikes uh, and even uh, you know, tricycles. And then we took them and organized them. This, each category of the traders at that time organized around themselves. And we ended up with 10 branches. Each one of the branches is independently uh, you know, uh, registered, registered. 
and they had membership of between 275 to 525 traders each. That was initially. Initially, yeah. Uh, and then they all came together and we formed a national, na national umbrella. At the regional level, they all wanted to be independent. They want to work on their own. It's true, their issues and dynamics are different. But at the national level, they cannot take on the top level policy makers on at a regional level. So we formed a national umbrella, which is called the DTA. Uh, but DTA has its own license and certificate of registration. These 10 had their own as well. Um, and at the time of 2010, when we were again terminating, closing that project, they, were, they had 8,500 registered members. And we had developed the whole system of management and the services they were providing to their members. Um, and they were, they were joining when we first did our first uh, impact study about a, a, month, a year later. You know, we noticed about 200 new members were joining every day. Uh, every month, sorry, yeah. So, yeah, good. To the like next today one. Today we have. Yeah, well, today, they, yeah, they're about 15,000. 2015, they were about 14,000. There's still about 28,000, you know, another 14,000 to go. So there is still scope for getting more and more. Okay. Yeah. And this is just pure. Yeah, this is just one of the sample of the things they did. They also, as an association, they all developed a code of conduct. They still retain it today. Any trader who gets licensed and certified, they have a code of conduct they ascribe to. They wear their badges. They have their identity cards. And this a lot had to do with how they do business to create a level playing field for them among their own members. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Harun. Really driven by two programs that DFID had funded. And there were changes at, at you know, a wide range of levels. We won't go into all the details about it because it will take quite a, take a long time. Um, but between the traders and the regulators, the self-regulation issues, the enterprises were growing. When I met the traders, they'd say, you know, since we've become licensed, we have grown significantly. We trade without fear of having our vehicles seized, our equipment impounded. One said, you know, I've doubled. I now have two trucks. Um, my volume of milk per week has quadrupled. In fact, I'm now working much more closely with my producers. I'm making sure that they're producing better quality milk because that's what I need to supply. And the Kenya Dairy Board was busy saying, we like this. We're earning more money. We get license fees and we're getting CES because Harun didn't mention the traders associations are actually collecting the CES for the CES is a tax. Uh, it's a per liter tax. So they are now collecting this tax. But the cost of being licensed and the cost of the tax actually was a fraction of what they were being hit up for with fines, delays. The transaction costs of, of not being regulated were significantly greater than the costs of regulation. Yeah, the cess was 0.2%. It's nothing. It was like, you don't need what your shilling used to be divided into something. Yeah. So we had, by the end of this process, you know, there was a, a much more clarity and transparency of the regulatory requirements. Basically, a pathway to formalization, to registration was created, and the tools to get there. You need to be licensed and certified, ah, but we have a mechanism to get you there. And if you become certified, the value proposition is that you will pay fewer costs. You can get loans from banks, because the banks were also coming saying, we want to give this guy a loan, but he's not licensed. So all of a sudden, you know, people like Equity were sponsoring training programs. And so there was a big move into the sector. And, uh, you know, a much reduced cost of doing business for the traders. Some of the associations would actually arrange for the health inspection at their association. Um, you know, as I mentioned, growth of enterprises, the volume of milk by the re licensed traders was going up steadily and upgrading of enterprises. Um, and so then at the Kenya Dairy Board, actually, it was much easier. You know, that question, how do you reach 30,000 traders? Well, they, they could reach the 10 associations and engage with them. They were getting more income, growing confidence and safety, and realistic engagement in the value chain by working with the dominant market players who were the informal traders. So what happened? I mean, this was 2001. 
Notice the price. The price of milk in 2001 was 27 to 30 for the raw milk and 50 to 52 for the packaged. Now back then, the packaged was almost 100% Tetra Pak, which is the most expensive packaging in the world. And the volumes of milk were 1.4 billion. By 2008, what's happened? The price of milk, seven years later, is pretty much the same. The nominal price has not changed. Well, seven years of inflation, the price should have gone up a lot. Prices remained low. What does that mean? If the price remains low, demand will increase. And so the volumes of milk being marketed, we've gone from 1.4 billion to over 2 billion liters of milk being sold through the sector. And what's interesting also is that the numbers of participants, from 600,000 farmers, it's gone to 750. And the numbers of traders, when we first did the study, we had no idea how many there were because nobody knew who the traders were. We now knew that there were 30,000. And as Haroon mentioned, at that point, about 10,000 were licensed and 20,000 weren't. Um, and so this was by really the end of the, the project, the end of DFID's engagement. So what's happened since? Because we now no longer have a project that's actively engaged with the regulator, trying to keep the balance of power. But we have created a, a traders association that is playing that role with them. Well, one of the things that did happen, you know, since 2010, um, there's been a changing political economy. The power of the large dairies is growing, and they are pushing on the regulator, um, especially now that the head of the largest brew, uh, dairy is the brother of the president. Um, and they've really pushed heavy on this uh, requirement for pasteurization. So before it was just going to be the, the certified. Um, but we've seen a lot of changes in the system. Kevin talked about the local dispensing machines, which were very popular in India. And he tried it as a service market. It never took. Now, how many of them are there? Thousands? And so there's a lot of milk where you just, you know, you put your money in and the pasteurized milk comes out. Um, at the bottom. But we're beginning to get more conflict, again, between the police and health. It's raising the cost to the traders a little bit. Um, and once again, the regulatory framework is not exactly reflecting what's happening on the ground. Also, for the Kenyans, you know that the devolution of authority to the counties is ongoing. And so there's been kind of a, a, a loss of information and understanding of how to best regulate the sector. So. Um, and there's a lot of different support. A lot of different projects are coming in and throwing, oh, I think this is the nice thing to do. And it's without really understanding how the whole system is working. Um, Haroon, do you want to just talk about what the sector looks like now? Well, I, I can't. I can't so yeah, th this, this is the map um, somewhere around last year. You'll notice the, you know, the emergence of pasteurizing, because one of the changes that happened in 2010 is um, the Kenya Dairy Board just put out a new regulation, say, yeah, traders, we are licensing you, but we no longer want you to sell raw milk. You have to pasteurize it. So the emergence of you know, small-scale pasteurizing unit, which I think is good for the industry, so to say, because it gives them ability to add value, um, sell their milk for longer. Uh, so they have some benefits. And some of the traders, because of the en licensed environment who had started growing, are the ones who, who, who started um, venturing into dispensing. Actually, for those of you who, in who, who are familiar with Kenya, actually the first dispenser was um, was put in in Tusky's supermarket by one of the traders who was licensed first, because his business had grown. Now he's now playing in the league of small dairy, uh, handling over sixty thousand liters of milk every day. And when he was trained and licensed, he was doing only five hundred liters. Very, and there are quite a number of them who are growing, who are who are in that category. So. Uh, the, right now, we see a lot of pasteurizing unlicensed milk traders. They're offering the pasteurizing services to other traders who now sell through the dispensers, to caterers, small retailers, and, in, and, and also the cooperatives. Uh, some of them, again, some trained, 
by by you know by the project in, in 208 and 07, but others who have now come and grown as a result of some of the other interventions, but now they have set up their own processing units. The large dairies have collapsed. Now they are they have been buying in buyouts, uh, but now there are three big ones, private ones. And the category of small dairy uh, processing units have grown and increased. Uh, but the number of farmers have also, it's remained almost the same, but what we have seen is increase in what we are calling s progressive smallholder who are more commercial, they having more cows, more focus on, on productivity, and also the large, a large number of medium to large scale, um, very commercially oriented dairy farmers. So, uh, but the chains have changed a little bit. Um, I think in future, we're going to see more movement from pasteurized milk, even among traders, as they upscale, the large dairies will not grow. They will not increase. The medium size, private and cooperatives, will grow and increase. And they have strong connections with, with, with the farmers. And as it is right now, in spite of all the efforts, 80% of milk still is marketed by informal oros, you know, the small scale sector. And uh, the, the large dairies and the cooperatives who, who are regarded as large as 105, you know, 540. So you see now it's about 2.6, 2.7 million liters of milk. So the industry has doubled. Yeah. So that, that's, that's what I can say. Thank you. I'm sure there's a lot of questions. I mean, the, the first thing is you actually can organize the informal sector. I think this is one thing that people, ah, you can't do that. But it's the markets and consumers that drive it. You know, it, it was the demand for milk at a low price by primarily the low-end urban market that was driving the demand for milk. For formalization to happen, it must benefit all parties. There has to be a clear value proposition to the regulator and to the market actor. Um, it takes many interventions. I mean. There was not a clearly laid out plan to work with the KDB. It started at one point, and then, they, oh, we, oh, we need this. Oh, OK, let's do that. We'll fix, oh, gosh, you don't know how to collect it. You can't keep track of it. So each one became kind of a sequential intervention. Um, but the regulatory practices are changing and being responsive. Uh, the other part is, I think, you know, just kind of lessons for all of us. Clear diagnosis, understanding the end market, which drives these things, and keeping an open mind. Don't have a preset. Know roughly where you want to get to, as Colin said. But let's figure out how we can work and respond to the way the sector is changing. Because you know, you'll get that new head of the Kenya Dairy Board who will throw a, mon a monkey wrench into the operations. And that happens everywhere. Markets change. Um, droughts, different things happen, and we have to be flexible to respond to those. But you also need to understand the whole market system. All the different levels are interdependent. The facilitation process needs to really understand the incentives of the market actors and address those. And then that last point of the changing political economy can support or undo. And so we really need to have a continuous process of monitoring and tracking it. But this is, you know, 15 years, it's been interesting, to me, it's very interesting to see how the sector has grown and changed and is becoming more sophisticated. And by creating a regulatory framework which allowed for the growth and with the right support to make it happen. Because if you had simply said, this is what you must do, but there's nobody to train you, there's no process to handle it, it would have never happened. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and open up for questions. Before you ask, I want to add just one thing. <coughs> Site was set up by an earlier different program to develop service providers. I mean, and, and uh, I think one of the missing ingredients now in a lot of programs is this capacity building. So, I mean, if you look back at it, if you go back to the late 90s, Difford was investing heavily in, in, in capacity building. In, and, 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 and capacity building, uh, uh, training NGOs, 
Psych was originally uh, like a quasi NGO. Was it, what was it? Yeah, and and it was a, it was a project thing, and then has now become a, a, a fully fledged company. And I, I think that's a very very important bit of why things have worked so well in in, in Kenya because of this long term investment. Any questions? Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful uh, contribution from the panel. Um, my question is around uh, access to certification service. You know, because clearly the Kenya Dairy Board played a very big role. You know, so I'm beginning to wonder, um, as it is today, how seamless or how is it, it is for market actors to get certification in terms of the length of time and how much money do they have to pay? And again, uh, I was also trying to figure out, um, I could imagine that quite a number of changes experienced by the Kenya Dairy Board. So how did you sequence some of those changes in terms of uh, increased income and um, you know, from better services? Because I can imagine there has been some incentive for the Kenya Dairy Board to provide this kind of service you know, in a continuous and efficient manner. So how, what are those, those incentives that makes this possible? Maroon, do you want to take, take a few minutes? OK, take a few questions. Anybody else? Can I, can I teach and ask two questions? Um, the first relates to your last conclusion around the political, con political economy. Um, given what you know now, if you were to do this again, are there any specific strategies that you would have taken to mitigate the risks uh, from the large dairies and the opposition that they might uh, put on the process. The second question, it's a fantastic example, I think, of sector transformation, but you didn't say too much about the actual impact apart from those numbers at the end. But women are often uh, important milk traders, but what we often see is that when a sector is informal, when it's not so lucrative, it's quite easy for women to be involved. When it becomes more formalized and more lucrative, it's also common for men to then displace women. And do you have any understanding of how that dynamic worked in this particular program? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Kevin from Enable, Nigeria. Um, two quick questions following on from the last one, um, just about probably targeted at, at um, Kevin and Collins, about if you were to go back and do it again, do you think that donors are risk tolerant now as they were back then? Could you take the same opportunities and the same flexibility? And the second one to Haruna, Enable works with associations in Nigeria. So what is the status of the Dairy Traders Association now? How are they funded? How do they operate? Um, do they continue to exist and grow? Um, and any lessons learned on how to s set up and allow a Dairy Traders Association to become independent and operate and uh, operate themselves? Thanks very much. One last question. Hello, I'm Victor Muhango from Black to Action in Malawi. Um, I was very interested with the presentation. Uh, I think you have talked about uh, a number of uh, factors that have driven success of the data sector in Kenya. But uh, my question is, um, uh, I, I didn't hear about other things like uh, the capacity of the country itself in terms of infrastructure um, and other challenges. For example, in Malawi, we, we don't have so much production and the infrastructure is not very good. Uh, but we have challenges in the data sector. Uh, so if you had a, a, a setup like that, would uh, things that you have presented today work? Thank you. Let's try to answer those. I can fill in. One, James, how training was done. The way we structured the training was that KDB accredits trainers, the independent trainers, who only get money if they present certificates to be signed. Normally what would happen is that as a trainer, accredited trainer by Kenya Dairy Board, I would recruit my clients. Once I've trained them, I'll call the local agent of KDB to ensure, to certify to, uh, you know, uh, that I have actually done it correctly. And once I have done, I take all the names and submit that list to the head office. And the head office will issue certificates and I'll get paid. So the trainers drive the market the training market a lot. And the, 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 the traders themselves really want the certificates because if it runs out, then they don't have a license. So the, the, this, this was a very, it's a very good relationship. 
That's how it was structured. And for the regional office of KDB, part of their reporting is how many traders are licensed in your area. They also had an incentive to ensure that trainer, the trainers are doing their job. That's how the system was. As far as the rates of payment, it varies from the category of trader to another. But on average, we noted it's an equivalent of um, three to four days earnings. Because the training is no, yeah, per year, for once a year, unless for the purpose of licensing. But these trainers were also offering other more uh, diversified courses. For example, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm learning how to handle milk, but soon I want to, to learn how to make yogurt. So that they will prescribe and run for that, and it's a different course. And it has nothing to do with licensing, it's about improving my business. So, and no one was, it's all self-funding system service for the traders association what, where does the oh okay the the traders now the the other question i think kevin asked uh, no is it kevin who are about the the payment how uh, the I'll, I'll jump your question i'll come back to it the the traders association re recruit members who are trained and licensed and they pay a subscription so the association at the regional level is fully supported by subscription actually both the the very local level uh, regional and national, they're all prescription supported. The project, the only investment the project made was setting up their national office in Nairobi. We bought furniture, bu bought them, uh, fun, you know, um, paid for their staff for six months, and that's it. We are exiting. So that's all the investment. Other is subscription. And we were developing the subscription system. And the subscription were only sustained as services continued you know, uh, you know, uh, being offered to the members. That, and now the question of... Where, where is it today? What's the, is the DTA still active? Remember, we, say we started with groups, very small groups of traders who are already doing a lot of their savings. They have a lot of other services they handle together. They formed an, uh, a regional association. Those regional associations are very, very strong because that they are connected directly to the traders. The Ambler is much weaker because it doesn't have many services it offers, but it's still existing. It's supported by the regions. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the way it is. Yeah, yes, but only actually all the money comes from the region to, to the nation. So the region has its share already. And some of them can be incorporative and say, we'll not give you money until you have talked to KDB about this new regulation. So that, that's, so the, the, there was a very clear division of, gov of, of, of power among them. Um, I, I think, I don't know, maybe, the, yeah, what would we have done? Just sorry, what would we do? Do we have any evidence on the impact of women? <laughs> I, I, maybe the second part of the question. I'll, I, I'll leave Kevin and <laughs> Collins to answer that one. What would the, the police, the one thing I think we didn't do well, and perhaps we could have done an, in hindsight, is push for higher level regulatory change. It happened at KDB. It didn't happen at the national statutes and the government, the top level government. There was no, we didn't enact changed the laws which Kevin did. We changed the practice but not the laws themselves. To do that we needed more time and more focus on enabling environment and push at that level. Engagement and utilization of social capital, I mean the political economy um, more, more strongly. That's what we could have done. But maybe that should have followed next. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, uh, just coming back to the Dairy Act, um, the, the, I think uh, it's really interesting that one aspect of the Dairy the, because they had already written, the Difford had brought in a, a legal drafting team. They had funded, I think it was a direct project from the office. It wasn't out to contract. They had written a new Dairy Act that had even been printed. I remember going to a box room in ministry. They were all piled up. They covered in dust. And the single thing that objected, people objected to was the big dairies. And it was a simple clause in it that the representatives of the dairy industry would be appointed by licensed members of that industry. That's why they objected to licensing the rural trade, because they would have lost their ability to appoint the dairy board. Now, you say, did, did we ever think of any reason to try and stop the influence of these big dairies? We would have loved to. 
But when the largest dairy is owned by a guy whose surname is Kenyatta, you can, I tell you what, you have some difficulty. And, and just to show you, I mean, a lot of people imagine, you know, Kenya being a very kind of uh, uh, active uh, investment destination. The Kenyan system has deliberately done one thing. Castle Breweries, which is now one of the big two breweries in the world, decided to set up a new brewery in Kenya. They killed it. The guys who owned the existing breweries killed it because every single shipment of barley got held up at the port. It even got a little bit of water on it. And I promise you, in the end, one of the largest, most best equipped uh, brewing facilities in Africa ended up being junked. I mean, and let me tell you, Parmalat, Parmalat, one of the largest dairies in the world, decided to come into Kenya and invest. They also lost. So the, the power of these big dairies, and I think it, it's a point that will come up when and I'm doing another presentation tomorrow on, on the, the meat industry. When you have immovable forces, it, and you can analyze that immovable force in a, in a value chain, Leave it alone. I mean, just bypass it. Because all you'll do is have frustration. I can tell you my story about the leather industry. Yeah. You know, and, and Ken. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, so just avoid it. One, one other thing. The, 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 um, what would you have done differently? Okay, what would we have done differently? I, um, well, I, you know, I might have, uh, when I went out drinking with the, de the head of the dairy board, I might have taken a few more paracetamol. But I mean, apart from that, <laughs> no, I mean, really, this was one of those things where it just happens. And I, and I think that serendipity bit of, of what's happening in market development is the bit that you really have to appreciate about the story. It, it just happened that, that all the things were aligned. The stars came out, and they were all in the right order. The luck. Yeah. Jim. The luck. Yeah. <laughs> what would you have done differently? All right. <laughs> that would have been a nice one. At least I would have had some black hair up to now. But uh, when I look at the, the whole thing, and I think you understand this, given what you have done in your sectors, really, the real issue we are dealing with in any value chain is issues around the governance of the value chain. Any value chain we work in, you'll find that if the power balances within that value, value chain are wrong, then you'll have a dysfunctional or a skewed value chain. So if I was to design a program again, I would look at what are the key governance issues within the value chain that need strengthening. And therefore, I would want to develop more programs around business membership organization. How do you strengthen them to actually champion courses in that? For instance, uh, I remember those of you who know CAPSA in Kenya. How many of you know CAPSA? CAPSA was basically individual people in the industry who were brought together and then we empowered them to actually challenge government on key issues. And they have become a major driver in the private sector. The same, I think. It is important that we identify key drivers within the industry, give them a voice or a structure that they can have that voice, and they can change the governance within the value chain. So I would invest more in business membership organizations within the sector. I would invest there. Secondly. Kevin talked about the fact that DFID spent most of the 90s building capacity of service providers. The reason why many of us are struggling in our M4P programs elsewhere in other countries is because you try to find somebody who even understands how this thing works and you are in trouble most of the time. If you build sufficient capacity of people who understand the nitty gritty of working with membership, membership organization, people who understand how you facilitate organizations to take charge of their own destiny, I think I would invest more in that. Your question, John, on, <coughs> on women being displaced, I'm telling you I have no answer for that. 
But believe me, the nature of markets is that those who can invest more will likely displace those who have less to invest. That is the nature of market. So if women were participating, but the investment required for them to continue participating is slightly higher and they don't have that level of investment, they will be displaced. And I think the challenge is how do you ensure you reduce the amount of displacement at the long run? That is the challenge I would have in the sector. No, I'm not saying that is what happened. I'm saying that chances are in any market environment, and I'm not speaking specifically to the dairy sector because I've not done a study to find out who were displaced. But in any market environment, the truth is that those who are likely to move in to take up what? The emerging opportunities are likely to be people who have resources to invest in that. So that then disadvantages many women who might not be able to invest a lot at any one particular time. Let the Haroon talk to you. I, um, okay, I can, I can, when we did um, a, a brief gender mapping of who the beneficiaries of the work are, one, uh, I think it was, may have been by choice of DFID, dairy sector happened, about 75% of all the active laborers and owners of dairy farms are women in Kenya. That's, that, so there was that base consideration that any improvement in the sector increasing incomes and that has continued to be the case when the licensing and the training the largest number of benefits about 60 percent of those who came for licensing are women they didn't they, they didn't want to deal with the law enforcement a certificate a license for them was security to do business so they had a very very high incentive and we noticed that the number of milk bars owned by men and women were equal. It was a new opportunities. And many women could operate in that field because they were not good at selling, peddling bicycles, delivering milk. So in actual sense, the project created more opportunities for women. It's only that Kevin never asked us, for example, to give us any numbers. Um, from a commercial perspective, I'm still concerned that uh, the price per liter hasn't really moved. So if um, we are to talk about getting value out of it then it's put you know having more cows and we know about the pressures of land for smallholder farmers and as somebody who has actually reared a cow myself a cow is like a baby it's an eight to five job you can only do so many of them so we've seen gluts so the industry is very seasonal we've seen gluts the middle class is expanding we suddenly have a taste for cheeses we're taking milk to Tanzania, to Uganda. So what would it take for the informal sector to get into value addition and increase the markup per liter? Because that doesn't seem to have changed. Well, it, it hadn't changed in by 2010. It has gone up quite a bit since 2010, which we didn't mention. First question, yes. Um, thanks, Bill and the team. Um, I just wanted to make a bit of a few comments. I had the opportunity of actually coming post to this program and designing the next program, which was called P Prime Program, which also incorporated some of the lessons uh, from this program into DFID and designed some value chain in 20 other sectors in Kenya. But um, a few things which was a bit of a concern was the gender lens, which you said is true. Um, initially, what happened is the choice of the program was based on the gender participation in the sector and the other value chain. But over a period, what happened is women were relegated a bit to the lower end of production of the value chain, and they were not able to have the opportunity to participate at the higher end of the value chain. And therefore, it put DFID in a bit of a difficult position whether to make a choice of continuing the program or not. Um, the second part of it, which I think was very, very is a learning lesson also for DFID is just about the systemic change. It's, it depends now. This is something which MSD literally have to struggle with. When we talk about systemic change, where is the start and where is the end of the systemic change is very, very important. And this is the lesson we learned from this program. Um, as much as all the gains are attributable to this program, one of the things which happened 
is there wasn't a lot of change at the processor level, the large processor level. Therefore, the program actually increased a lot of production. There was a lot of milk out there, but there wasn't really the absorption capacity at the processor levels, and therefore there was a problem now between a mismatch between what could be processed and what could be absorbed within the local market, the raw level, and that is where you see there is very minimal change in terms of the raw milk and the processing. But yes, one thing which Francis said is over a period, small processes emerged and they started filling up the processes, and that is maybe a continual sort of um, thing which happened. Incidentally, some of the things which I was not able to understand about this program was Kenya still imports powdered milk because there isn't enough domestic milk production. I've not really understood this because when you try to do a bit of a mapping between the demand, the market demand and, and, uh, and the production level, it seems too much, but in reality there is a lot of imports again and I, I, I just wanted to ask a bit of a question between these. What exactly is the fundamental changes between these? Because there's a bit of a mismatch. But the bigger question, I think, which I just wanted a bit of it is, in 1991, as a result of structural adjustment program, there was an, an unplanned market liberalization in the economy of Kenya. And this generally affected the whole agriculture sector. That is from coffee to tea to dairy to cotton. And over a period, that is from 1991, most of these sectors, in the initial period, it was a controlled economy. There was a bit of a struggle trying to find the fit and the market and you know the demand and supply sort of curve really meeting at a point of equilibrium was quite a bit of a challenge. And over a period, most of these sectors now have stabilized. I just wanted to get from the team for the dairy sector, which was initially a very controlled economy and then 1991 liberalized, how much of the gains will be attributable to a natural market evolution as compared to the intervention of BSDMP? And this is very, very fundamental because when for DFID and the prime program we did a bit of an assessment, we found that every other sector that we never did the intervention in actually had almost an equivalent or somehow near sort of transformation, which is part of a market sort of systems. The market just is stabilizing post-liberalization, market liberalization, as compared to the intervention. So it's good to get a bit of an insight and comment from the team on this. And then, right now, ASI, post this program is doing 20 sectors. When you do a bit of that, it shows that maybe are we uh, overstating the results in reality compared to the natural evolution of the sector itself? Thanks. A long comment. Thank you, yeah. Haji. Thanks, Bill. My name is Augustine Adongo, but I'm not from Kenya, I'm from Ghana. I know I have cousins in Kenya. There are many Adongos in Kenya, but don't mistake me for a Kenyan, I'm from Ghana. And I don't drink fresh milk that much because we don't have it. I love it. The last question that he asked, I was going to ask that too. So he's already done that for me, so I'm not going to bother that much about that. That's a counterfactual. And history shows that, in fact, where governments or anybody intervenes. Classic example, rice in Japan. The government intervened, and even today, rice in Japan is not competitive. Government did not intervene in the auto industry, because they thought the auto industry and the electronics industry were not nationally important they have become the most competitive. So how much of this is actually due to natural market forces at work? And how much credit can we actually take? But the second one is, I, I take the point that yes, as implementers, we do need some luck. But in our sector selection process, how much of it comes down to just recognizing the win and riding it. Because we tend to say that's very difficult to do.
why shouldn't we be working on the most difficult to do rather than just riding the wave? There was a law that said milk shall be consumed in all schools. That's a wave. We just caught it and rode along. And when we did the study in 2001, the big pressure was they were trying to make everything illegal. And they were trying to shut down all of that 85 percent. Well, Diffid had changed the law. Diffid had rewritten the law. Diffid had, you heard Kevin say, Diffid had rewritten the law, but it, it was legal that they could trade milk. So that was, a, that was the big constraint. The problem was the transactions costs inside the sector that they were 25 to 30 percent of the sales price of milk was fines, um, things that they were having to address. So by getting the legalization of the process, it actually reduced those transactions costs and took them out of the system, which is why the price of milk was able to stay low, which kept demand high. Because if the price had gone up you know, to the 50, market demand would have dropped significantly, and then you would have had a really major problem with the glut of milk from the 650,000 smallholders who would not have had any market to sell to. And they would have gone out of business. So if you had lost 300,000 producers, that's a problem. And so that's what the, the large dairies policy, their intention was actually to make themselves the sole buyer, push down prices, make it unprofitable for people to sell. Uh, but let me hand over to the pan other panelists. Just quick comments. I think Marianne, um, uh, Bill has addressed the issue of price. Yeah, there was no increase between 201 and 208. And because the traders and the people in the system were benefiting from reduced transaction cost. Generally, the, pri the producer price in Kenya is still, if you're speaking for as a farmer, you're speaking from, yeah, we want higher prices. Unfortunately, Kenyans are paid more than the farmers in the EU. At the moment, the EU price per litre is 0 0.3 to 3.4 euro cents per litre. Kenyans are asking for 40. You know, we have a lot of inefficiencies. And that's why we need, when we come to investing in dairy farming, uh, we need to make it more efficient. I'm a dairy farmer myself. We can do much, much more for the same effort and produce much more milk. We have issues that we need to deal with. But coming to you, uh, your, your comment, actually, this MDP project, and I'll speak not from, for Bill, but at least for the part we were dealing with, we were not dealing with the entire dairy sector. We were dealing only with the marketing and marketing in the informal sector. Now, and, but as, a, as an industry, we have a very serious problem as a whole. When you take from production all the way to uh, competition at a global level. There are many, many issues, and we don't, unfortunately, we don't have yet a, a comprehensive strategy. It took nine years to come up with a, a daily strategy, which was, by the end time it was finished, it was completely out of date. We still have the same situation. So, and that, and unfortunately, a lot of money is being put in the industry even today without a coherent structure. So, unfortunately, the, but the, the counties, donors, I'm sorry, including DFID, and others, we have a major problem. If you ask them, what is the national blueprint? Uh, blueprint? Doesn't exist. And therefore, BSMDP was only tackling, because it's uh, addressing issues of market access for poor farmers who sold their milk through the informal traders. That was the piece we were looking at. If you look at uh, you know, what about the, the growth? The we didn't do the analysis, comparative analysis with other sectors and attribute growth. But one thing for certain, the rising incomes. Inherent. If you look at the other sectors, tea, coffee, everybody is talking about poor prices, poor incomes we're getting out. It doesn't happen in daily. So maybe should we look, uh, you know, expand our mirror of analysis? Just to come back to the changes and what has stimulated growth, I think it will be an interesting discussion. But uh, you know, uh, but it, I think I, I think there were yes, we cannot over emphasize oversell the impact 
but and neither attributed to the entire industry growth. But certainly for the people it was targeted for, it has a tremendous, yeah. In terms of politics, dumping, a very strange, qu in interesting question. Who authorizes powder milk in Kenya? I sat in the National Dairy Task Force for many years. There is none. The National Dairy Task Force does not allow or authorize any importation of powder milk. We don't. But it's dumping, especially EU when they have ears, they just, it's dumped, brought into the country. For a processor reconstituting it, they have a very big margin and they don't have to haggle with farmers. It's been a bad behavior on the part of Kenyan industry. And if you ask me, I, you know, I, I need to go, I would go to every processor and bing, bang their heads and tell them, please be industry, behave like industry who own the industry and the sector. So uh, it has been bad politics, but in the last few years, we haven't had that, and neither have we had about any talk of GATT, and I remember taking on the new MD at Daily Board, someone talked about a GATT in the industry. But then someone told me they are just looking for money for tre in, to, in Treasury so that they can start piling up money for the school milk project, which they are starting to think. So, but in real sense, there is no legal licensing of, of, of milk powder. Uh, there are a few value-added products, but those, uh, you know, uh, don't have major significant impact. I, I can go on and talk about dairy. I, I think there's actually one other very interesting factor is that, you know, the large dairies, when they have enough of their milk, they would stop buying. And the informal traders are actually for the larger cooperatives who were selling to the dairies. They use the informal traders as their escape valve. I mean, there was a period in 2012 when the large dairies just said, we're not buying anymore. And a lot of these more formalized producers were in a crisis mode, but the informal dairy, informal traders came in and picked up all of it. Yes. Which, you know, it's, it's that question, if you've got the power relationship, you, and they were trying to screw the, the, their suppliers on price. They were trying to push them down on price. And the informal traders pay a higher price to the producers, to the farmers. So it's actually, it's more beneficial all the way through the system. Higher price to the farmers, lower price to the consumers. So the informal trade, we didn't get into the nitty gritty of every single part of it. Um, but that was, I think, just an important point to make. Collins. Just a quick one. I think uh, Harun actually nailed on really what was the intention of the program. We were very clear when we, this was being designed that it was going to look at that sector that impacted most on the smallholder producer. And it was designed with that context in mind as part of the broader dairy what sector. We had expected then that other people would pick pieces. And the USAID during that same period was quite big on the other side of things. So we were simply contributing to the development of the sector. We could not have imagined that we were going to change the whole sector. And that should really be the, the, the spirit of working in market development. You can't do everything. You can't answer all the questions in the space. But you can contribute. So if today somebody asked me, did you can you attribute what happened to this? I would say, maybe no. But if you asked me, assuming we didn't do what we did, what would have been the other effect? Then we are talking business. Thank you, Colin. So I've been told that our time is up, and we must wrap it up. I would like to thank the panelists. I'll call them my fellow panelists.